And let's talk about this upcoming weekend's very nice UFC Fight Night card. UFC Fight Night, Dariush versus Sarukian. Headlined by these two lightweight greats, Benil Dariush and Armin Sarukian. The co-main is Jalen Turner stepping in against Bobby King Green. We also have Rob Font versus Davison Figueredo. Sean Brady versus a returning skinnier Kelvin Gastelum. We have a Clay Guida fight. We have Puna Soriano uh, taking on Dustin Stoltzfus. We have Misha Tate in the feature bout on the prelims. This card <laughs> is phenomenal, for, especially for a fight night card. Yes. Uh, let us start with Drakkar Close and Joe Selecki. But before we do, are there any other fights or fighters on this card, given how stacked it is, that you guys want to quickly spotlight for our listeners and viewers? Bro, so I, real, real first. quick, I just because you said something about skinny Gaslam. Like, are we sure this boy is gonna make weight? Because he don't look skinny. He's a... he does not look skinny at all. Oh, he's really? I saw I saw a couple of things and I thought he looked good. I, I'm not saying he looks bad. I'm not saying he looks bad at all. He no, just he doesn't look baby. like he's 170 pounds. You know what I'm really? saying? Really. Yikes. We'll just, see. Oh, he just like looks a, like I mean a couple days. I can't imagine that Gaslam is going to get smaller the older he gets. Like he, he is two, filling like out days. and he's not going backwards. No, not even. He's he cut like, a lot of the fat out. I can say that for sure. But he has like 30, 40 hours. He is it, how tall is Gaslam? Is he, is he like see. only it's, five eight, it's five nine? So it's always yeah, a he's battle. about my height actually. He's about my. I think he's like an inch taller than me. I want to say five nine. I, I stood next to him, so I'm I'm trying to remember how five nine. Was. Yep. Yeah, he is. He's just taller than me. Yeah. But he's a thick, dense guy. He is. He, yeah, dude. I would not be able to wrap my arms around that dude. He is. That is a thick <laughs> boy. That's that is a thick boy. Um. Anyway, continue. I just I wasn't sure how thin <laughs> thin Gaslam was. You know what I'm saying? Are you trying to tell me? <clears throat> That if he was facing off against Tom Aspinall, Tom Aspinall would not be able to reach out and put his arms around Kelvin Gastelum. He'd probably put his fucking hand on his shoulder instead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I did right. not Anybody realize else? where you were going with that. Well done. Oh, no? <laughs> no. I wasn't paying enough attention. I've been putting the odds. I never wrote in the odds. I probably would have caught it otherwise. Uh, who else? Who else? Anybody else do you guys want to quickly... Oh, oh yeah, yeah. card. Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm interested in Mel Melchizael Costa. He's fighting. He's fighting Steve Garcia. Yeah, he I'm has like definitely that. looked interesting. He's got some nasty Muay Thai, and Garcia comes to scrap. So that's probably gonna be a fun fight. Um, this dude Hadolfo Bellato that's debuting against uh, Ihor Potierius seems like he might be a beast. Veronica Hardy's on it. I I was. Super surprised with how much better she looked when she came back. Granted, yeah. it was against uh, Juju. So, not 100% sure what to take away from it, but I guess we'll find out in this one. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that's it for me. Dog, Dan Hardy talks up that girl so so well that he's got me fucking believing that this girl is going to whip somebody's ass. Oh, yeah. He's been saying that she can be champion. Like, he is... Yeah. He is pushing, but he's got me. But he's got, he's got me. He's selling me on it. He's selling it's me on wife. it like it's a timeshare. It's dangerous. She, she's it's the his... underdog. She's the betting underdog in that fight against Jamie Lynn Horth. But dude, I bet you got to take it with a grain of salt. Nothing against Veronica Hardy or Dan Hardy. I love Dan Hardy, but it's his wife. Oh, I know. Yeah, I'm fully totally aware. Not. I'm fully aware. I'm saying Dan Hardy does a great job though of championing his he wife. Does. Yeah, because he's telling he's selling me on it, and I don't. You know, I'm not there. But he's got me. He's got me hooked now. So I'm, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely ready to see her fight and see what she's got. I'm, I'm so regretful that Dan Hardy was let go by the UFC. He was one of their best me commentators, too. one of their best color guys. He's 100%. one of those guys who was a talented as hell fighter. Is has a great mind for the sport for competing. He has a fucking PhD level knowledge of fighting, and the great combination is that those things combined with the fact that he has the gift of gap. Like he's a great talker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it sucks when you can like articulate that. that stuff really well. It's it's it, I think it's a rare skill, you know, Dan Hardy does that really well. Robin black, you know, a lot of those yeah. analysts, I think I mean, the they very few do. guys right. do very well. well. 
yeah. all the guys who, who who get called up to that job by the UFC, uh, yeah. you know, they're they're pretty talented at that as well. Anyway, yeah. not to get too bogged down. Here we go. Let's start in the lightweight division about between Joe Selecki and Drakkar Close. So Selecki is the 30 year old out of New Jersey. He's 13 and three as a pro. He uh, has nine submission wins to his name. Uh, and he's coming off back to back wins coming into this weekend. He'll take on Drakkar Close, the 35 year old. Out of South Haven, Michigan, not too far from me here. He's 13-2 and two and one draw, five knockouts to his name. Also, coming off back-to-back -back wins coming into this weekend. Mark, start us off. Give us your take and your pick of Selecki and Close. Odds very tight here. Close is minus 125. Selecki is plus 105. Uh, they're the same height. Selecki has a half-inch reach advantage. Selecki is not someone I've ever been able to fully buy into as a guy who I feel can beat the upper portion of this division. But the man is 5-1 and one in the UFC at this point, and his only loss is, is a split to Jared Gordon. So <clears throat> the record is showing that maybe I'm wrong, but Drakkar Close is solid, man. I, I just think he's better. I, I think he carries more danger on the feet. I think he's the better wrestler. Uh, yes, Selecki will have the advantage when it comes to who's the bigger submission threat and could certainly find something, but, and maybe he fights a little smarter than close does, but I just, I just think close is, is the better athlete quicker hits harder. I think he can keep it standing if that's what he wants to do. And I, I think it'll show that he's the better fighter here. So I, I will go with close UD. <clears throat> Omar. I would agree with that as well. I think close not only is, uh, is the better fighter overall. I think his experience is better. I don't think he'll be getting worked on the ground. I think the way that Selecki <clears throat> needs to be able to do to people in order for him to take advantage of those positions. Um, and I think standing up, I think close is going to be able to put pause on him. Um, I just think he's going to be a lot stronger. I think he's going to hit a lot harder. I think Selecki is going to use his striking to try to set up the ground game. And I think when it doesn't work, I think close is going to be able to smother him uh, and really put some, put some damage on him. So I'm going to go with uh, Jakar close third round TKO. Uh, yeah, we're unanimous on this one. Uh, I couldn't say it better than Mark. I think that Close is just going to be the better fighter. Uh, I'll take Close in a UD as well. For those keeping track at home, Mike retook a one-fight lead on me this weekend. So the drama is is building. <sighs> Not that many cards left here. Yeah, I know. Only These a couple big left. fight picks. For those of you okay. also wondering... I am not in the mix here. <laughs> um, Next year, dude. Next I year. fucked up. I fucked up a long time ago. <laughs> I done fucked up. <laughs> Next year, 2024, I'm I'm going to make all heart picks. No more brain picks for me. No, that's... All feel. Bro, That's you're going to get my record. It's going to be against <laughs> me and you, and Mark's just going to be at the top of the heap <laughs> at that point. Uh, uh, all righty. Here we go. In the women's... Band speaking of hard picks. Speaking of, yeah. <laughs> uh, the great Misha Tate returning to the UFC Octagon, taking on Julia Raging Panda Avila. Uh, Misha Tate is the 37-year-old uh, from Tacoma, Washington. Her record stands at 19-9 and nine, coming into this weekend with 11 finishes. Seven of those are submissions. She's very much looking to get back, getting back to her winning ways. <laughs> Uh, coming off back-to-back -back losses and losing four of her last five uh, professional fights. Although after she lost back-to-back -back fights to Amanda Nunes and Raquel Pennington in 2016, she uh, retired and took a few years off and then returned, defeating Marion Renault, and now has lost back-to-back -back fights to Ketlin Vieta and most recently Lauren Murphy last July. So July of 2022. So another fairly long layoff for the 37-year-old Misha Tate, the former champ. This time, she'll be standing across from Julia Avila, the raging panda, the 35-year-old fighting out of Bakersville, California. Her record stands at 9-2 and two coming into this weekend with four knockouts and two submission victories on her record. And she's coming off of a submission win over Julia Sulyarenko. Uh, excuse me. Uh, she has not fought in a minute either. Uh, that last fight was in June of 2021. So 
both ladies coming off of long layoffs. Misha Tate, the former champ, Omar, tell us, who are you picking and why? Well, I'm picking Misha Tate because I'm overly emotional. <laughs> um, she, Tate hasn't looked great in her recent performances. I think she's trying to find her footing again. I think the landscape has changed a lot since uh, she was really involved in the game. Um, I just, it's, it's difficult for me to gauge it because somebody for me like Julia Avila should not be beating Amisha Tate. But at this point, it is a very big possibility that that could happen. Um, I think the, 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 Performance she had against uh, Juju was fantastic, but it, it was an equally terrible performance from Juju as well. And we've Ooh. seen Misha Tate, like I said, have. Oh, no, that's not Juju. My bad. I was reading Julia Stoliarenko and I just read the first name and automatically just went into that, <laughs> into so that <laughs> mode. <laughs> um, but my point still is, is that. I, a, a Julia Avila should not be, in my head, beating a Misha Tate, but definitely a very big possibility at this point in Misha Tate's career. I'm going to stick on the Misha Tate train. If it blows up, it blows up. It is what it is. Uh, but I'm going to go with Misha Tate here by decision. I will go next. This is a very tough fight to pick. There are a lot of variables, a lot of question marks here. Uh, not a lot of recent data on either of these ladies. <laughs> Uh, like Omar said, Misha Tate, when Misha Tate returned and she fought Marion Renault, she looked great. Yep. And then she seemingly did a 180 in her fight against Ketlin Vieira. Um, and then she also did not look great against Lauren Murphy uh, last year. So, like I said, a lot of question marks. That being said, uh, Omar took the words out of my mouth. I, I don't want to live in a world where Misha Tate is losing and losing and losing. I'm going to guess that this in this year off, she has recalibrated some things. I don't think that Julia Avila will have any significant advantage over Misha Tate in anywhere in this fight. Uh, Misha, Tate, <clears throat> Misha Tate, for once, uh, has the height and size advantage, I believe, over her opponent. Um, yeah, I'll go with Misha Tate by decision, but not with any great degree of confidence, Mark. Give us the odds and your take. Did you say Misha was bigger? She's two inches taller. Isn't she? I have well, it that at... she's one inch shorter and two and a half inch less of reach. I'm looking at Sure Dog. And on Sure yeah, Dog Misha Tate is 5'6". Five, six, six. And saying Avila is 5'4". Yeah. Wow. Tabo Maybe that's wrong. I, I got it from Tabology, so they just must have a different. Unless I wrote it wrong. Let's Let's check. If Oops. I wrote it wrong, because now I'm curious. I'm going to check oofs.com. Yeah, Tapology has Avila as 5'7". Oh. I wonder what UFC has. Uh, the like UFC that. has Avila at 5'7", and Misha Tate oh. at 5'6". Yeah, so I think then, sure dog sure may dog be wrong, because that, that would make sense sure with the reach, because Avila's reach is two and a half inches more. Um, well, then never mind. So, yeah, betting odds Avila is the favorite. She's minus 145. Misha is plus 120, so pretty tight. Um, Avila a bit bigger, as we just said. And I get it that she may be a bit bigger and that she has shown some good things. But for me, if Misha doesn't win this fight, she can just call it right here because there's no reason to keep pushing on this comeback bid if she's not beating Julia Avila because Prime Tate would, would wreck her. Um but with that said, I still think this tape beats her. I, I think Avila can be out wrestled, and I would like to think Misha is still capable of that. She can eat some shots and be okay. We know that if that's what she has to do to close the distance, and I think that she won't have that much trouble getting inside. So I will go with her to win a wrestling based UD. Okay. Oh, I got to give the next one. Son of a bitch. Hold you got to what the next one? I got a cue at the next one. Oh. I'm going Puno. This is going to be a fun fight. It's hard not to root for Puno Soriano, man. Okay. Where are we here? 
in the middleweight division, Puna Storytime Soriano taking on Dustin Stoltzfus. So, so <clears throat> excuse me, Soriano is a 31 year old out of Hawaii, USA. His record stands at nine and three with eight finishes. Six of them, six of his nine wins have come by knockout. He's looking to get back in the win column after getting knocked out by the rising Roman Kopilov back in January of this year. <clears throat> and he is back taking on the Pennsylvanian Dustin Stoltzfus, uh, 32 years old. His record stands at 14 and five with seven finishes, five of, the, of them submission victories. Also looking to get back in the win column after losing to Abus Magomedov in September of last year. So a little over a year since he has stepped into the octagon. Omar, start us off this time. Give us your take and your pick for Soriano versus Stoltzfus. You know, this is a an interesting fight for me because I don't I don't particularly rock with Stoltzfus. I don't I don't I don't really expect much from him, I guess. But Soriano is one of these guys, man, that like could be doing real, real well and then drops the ball, right? Uh, a real Butterfingers kind of moment, fucks up completely, gasses out, lets the fight go. Like we've seen a lot of these things happen over time um, in, in some of his more recent fights and especially in the last like four years or so or like two or three, I'm probably more accurate. But my point is, is he's, he's so unreliable that it's difficult to pick him against a lot of people. Stolfus, though, is probably one of those guys that I would pick him to win against. Uh, I don't I don't trust Stolfus probably even more than I don't trust Soriano at this point. So I'm going to go with Soriano here. I think if he does win, though, he's probably going to end up knocking him out. So I'm going to go with Soriano by knockout round two. Yeah, I agree. I, I look at... Soriano's record, and he has lost to a few guys recently who uh, have really climbed or are climbing up to the uh, upper echelon of uh, middleweight, particularly Brendan Allen, and more recently Roman Kopilov, who really is proving himself to be uh, a, a real banger at middleweight. That being said, I'm going to roll with Soriano one more time, uh, even though he's lost three of his last four. Uh, uh, I'm a fan of his striking. I'm a fan of his power. And I think he's going to get it done over Stoltzfus. Uh, I'll say he finishes him by TKO in round two. Mark? So Poon is a pretty sig significant favorite. He's minus 300. Uh, Stoltzfus is plus 240. One inch of height and two and a half inches of reach for Stoltzfus, though. Uh, I think this is a loser gets cut fight. I think these guys are fighting for their jobs. Stoltzfus has lost four of five in his UFC tenure. Puna has lost three of his last four. Granted, he's at least three and three overall in the UFC, but if he can't beat Stoltzfus and the, and loses four out of five himself, I, I think the Puna experiment in the UFC is probably over. So he better get this done, and I do think that he will. I, I think Stoltzfus is a perfect matchup for him. I think he's there to be hit and is potentially an opponent that Puna could finally style on. Um, so I, I, I think he will do that. I could see him even mix in wrestling at times. And I think eventually he puts him out and we're going to be unanimous. Cause I am also saying round two knockout for Puna. Oh, baby. <clears throat> Three round two knockouts. It better be a fucking round two knockout. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go up to the light weight division with clay. The carpenter Guida taking on Joaquim Silva. Clay Guida, the ageless wonder, is the 41-year-old, I'll say that again, the 41-year-old fighting out of Round Lake, Illinois. My goodness. Uh, his record stands at 38 and 23. That is quite the record. That's what happens when you've been crazy. fighting for probably m more than 50, two decades. 50,000 years. Of his 38 victories... Uh, 21 have come by way of finish, seven of them knockouts, 14 of them submissions. Uh, he's looking to get back in the win column once again after losing to uh, Rafa Garcia back in April of this year. Uh, he has sort of been ping-ponging back and forth between wins and losses for, well, many years. Uh, 
But Klinguida, a fan favorite and rightfully so. Uh, people always appreciate, or fight fans always appreciate his energetic style. He has an endless motor, uh, but it's going to be tested this time against the very talented Joaquim Silva. His his nickname is Neto BJJ. I'm not really sure what that uh, has something to do with jujitsu. He is the 34 year old fighting out of Goiás, Brazil. I'm saying the Neto part. What is Neto? No, I know. I'm saying when you did this, something to do with jujitsu, I said. <laughs> Likely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His record stands at 12 and 4 with seven knockout wins and three submission victories as well. Huh, you'd think he'd have more. Submissions and knockouts, Mark. That's his with fucking all that, name. With all that <laughs> Neto BJJ he's got going on. <laughs> uh, he's also looking to get back in the win column after getting knocked out by Armin Sarukian back in June of this year. Uh, I will go first this time. Uh, I will be rolling with the Brazilian uh, Joaquim Silva only because at this point, Clay Guido, please retire. I appreciate you. I love you. But uh, I don't really want to see you get punched in the face by a younger, stronger, more dynamic striker uh, in, in Silva here. So I will be taking Silva. I will be taking Silva by UD because I think that Clay Guida is a master of like not going away ever in a fight. Um, so Silva by UD is my pick. Uh, Omar, go. I think I think Joaquin Silva is not a foregone conclusion that it's he's going to beat Clay Guida. Clay Guida's got twenty years of miles on him. He's got another fifty thousand miles on his face. <laughs> um, but this man comes to scrap. He is an energizer bunny, and short of you putting him to sleep or knocking him clean the fuck out, probably not going to get the better of him in that sense. So. Um, I just think Clay Guida is going to find a way to tough out the early onslaught that is most likely coming his way from Silva. And I think once we hit round two ish, I think we're going to start to see Silva slow down little by little. Clay Guida doesn't do that. Um, even at 150 years old or whatever he is. Uh, and I think we're going to see Clay Guida take over in round three. And I think we're going to see him melt him. So I'm going to go with Clay Guida round three TKO. Wow. wow. Mark. We have our first difference. We were unanimous all the way to this point. Um, odds are wider than I thought they'd be. Silva is minus 335. Clay is plus 255. One inch of height for Silva, one inch of reach for Guida. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I think those odds should be closer. This fight's tricky to me because I do think Silva is a much more talented fighter than what his record shows and that that could potentially be visibly obvious in a matchup like this one against Clay. But at the same time, as up and down as Clay has been, you know, three and three in his last six, the three wins are Michael Johnson, Leo Santos, and Scott Holtzman. So it's not like Clay can't beat legit dudes anymore. All those dudes are legit. So I don't think Clay should just be looked past here. And obviously Omar didn't look past him at all, but Silva is, so strong and so powerful. Plus, he's got good jits. He's got Neto BJJ. Um, <laughs> and I think that those things can combine to provide him an, enough chances to hurt Clay. Because I think he'll be a little hard to control for for long stretches. And I think that's going to give him some chances on the feet to, to hurt Clay. And I think he's going to have all 15 minutes to do it because I don't see Clay getting him out of there. So I'm going to say he eventually finds it, and I'm going to go round three TKO for Silva. Oh, baby. All right. Now we're, now we're getting into the big fights. Yeah. Dude, this is like a pay-per-view from this point forward. These four yes. fights are fucking stacked. They are. It does feel like a pay-per-view. <clears throat> a lot of names, a lot of star power. Let's go. Uh, we go now to the welterweight division, a fight between Sean Brady and Kelvin Gastelum. So Sean Brady, the 31-year-old out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. His record stands at 15-1 and one with 
seven finishes, three of them knockouts, four of them are submissions coming off of his very first loss of his professional year of professional career, getting TKO'd by Bilal Muhammad back in October of last year. So a little over a year out of the cage for Sean Brady, looking to get back to his winning ways and welcoming Kelvin Gastelum back to the welterweight division. Gastelum needing no introduction to MMA purists and diehards. The 32-year-old, wow, he's only 32, out of Yuma, Arizona. His record stands at 18-8 and eight with one no contest coming into this weekend. With 11 finishes, six of those are knockouts. Most recently, winning by UD over Chris Curtis earlier this year in the spring. Although he had uh, been losing quite a bit at middleweight. Um, pretty much his loss to Adesanya set off a string of losses with a... One middle in the one middle, no one win in the middle of all of that, defeating uh, Ian Heinish, uh, but then he lost to Whitaker. He lost to Cannonier. I will go first once again. Man, oh man, interesting fight, tough fight to pick. My heart says I want to go with Kelvin Gaslam because I want him to be relevant once again in the promotion. I definitely, I've been wanting this guy. I've said this a few times on this damn show that this guy belongs at fucking welterweight. He belongs at fucking welterweight. And finally, we're getting it. But I think that this is a very, very difficult task for Kelvin Gastelum. Would I like for this fight to stay on the feet and for Kelvin to show off his probably much superior boxing skills? Yes. Do I think that's going to happen? No. <laughs> Even though he's moving down to welterweight, he's been fighting 85ers. He is fighting one of the thickest... Uh, most stout and built welterweights uh, in the top 10 in Sean Brady. He's top 10, right? He's got to be. Probably. Second guessing myself for a second. He's he's ranked. Oh, yeah. He's certainly ranked. Um, so I think that Sean Brady, <laughs> as much as I want to pick Gaslam, I think that Sean Brady is going to use his grappling. He's going to make sure. What's that? Nine. He's nine. Thank you. Uh, I think Sean Brady is going to use his wrestling. I think he's going to find his way to the mat with Kelvin. I know Kelvin has a bit of a wrestling base himself, but but Kelvin it really is known for his striking. And I think Sean Brady hops back in the wind calm. The guy is just a winner. As much as Kelvin has shown flashes of, of brilliance in his career, I mean, pre, pre-Alex Pereira, Kelvin gave Adesanya his toughest fight in that bout. And then look what he did to uh, Michael Bisping, man. Like, Kelvin can have real flashes of, of greatness. Um, but then you get a lot of losses as well with Kelvin. So Sean Brady being the winner that he is, I'm going to say that Sean Brady uses his, his, uh, his grappling here, gets himself a UD right back in the win column. Mark, why don't you go? <clears throat> realize I didn't have the odds written down for this fight somehow, so I just wrote them. Um, very tight. Sean Brady is the favorite. He is minus 125. Gastelum is even money, plus 100. One inch of height and one inch of reach for Brady. So, yeah, Kelvin is finally back down at 170 pounds where he belongs. Uh, I do think he looks good in the, in the images I've seen. He's sounding good. I've seen a couple interviews. Now we just need to buckle up and pray that this man actually makes the weight. But assuming he does, he is finally back at his proper weight class, and I believe he should be beating Sean Brady. I know Brady's good. I, I understand he hasn't lost to anyone yet other than Bilal. But if Kelvin is in good shape and is normal Kelvin, I don't think the game Brady has beats him. I, I expect Gaslam's wrestling to hold here. I don't think Brady has an easy time getting him into grappling situations. Um, you know, maybe he might find a couple, but I think Kelvin can work out of them. And on the feet, I think he can piece Sean up. So I'm excited to see this. I'm going to go with Kelvin. I, I do think it's possible that if he can stuff enough takedowns, he can even find a finish in this fight if he's causing prolonged striking exchanges. But I'm going to say it is Kelvin Gastelum by UD. 
Nice. Omar? I also agree with that. Um, I think Kelvin Gastelum, as long as he can make that scale properly and he doesn't look like he's killed himself to get there, I I, I think personally, I think he's just going to be a little bit more skilled. I do think his boxing is nasty. His hand speed is really, so really good. slick. Um, and the reality is, is that if he needs to rely on his box on his wrestling, he has the ability to do that as well. Um, and I think his, his wrestling is going to work a lot better on guys that are not like massively oversized against him. Um, so I think it'll be a good showing for Ke- for Kelvin Gastelum as long as he can make the weight uh, and make it well. So I'm going to go with Kelvin Gastelum here by unanimous decision. If he looks like shit on the scale, though, I reserve the right to change my pick. Oh, yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, All right, now we go down to the bantamweights. <clears throat> so we're going to have Sean Brady welcoming – Kelvin Gastelum down to the welterweights. And we're going to have Rob Font welcoming Davison Figueredo up from flyweight to the bantamweights. So Rob Font, the 36-year-old out of Boston, Massachusetts, 20 and 7 as a professional with uh, with uh, 13 finishes, nine of them knockouts, most recently coming off of a loss, a decision loss, Against Corey Sanhagen back in April of this year. <clears throat> Bear in mind, Rob Font has also lost three of his last four. Uh, but he is a great, nonetheless. Another great, Davison Figueredo, the former UFC flyweight champion, 35 year old, 35 years old, fighting out of Parra, Brazil. His record stands at 21 and three and one draw. With 17 finishes of his 21 wins, nine of those are knockouts, eight of those are wins by submission. And he's looking to get back in the win column and find his first win at this new weight class in the UFC after losing his belt to Brandon Moreno for the second time back in January of this year. So Figueredo, looking to reinvent himself at 135 pounds and start a new chapter in his career, Mark. Will Rob Font spoil the party? Your thoughts? So the betting lines indicate that he will, but it's very close. He's minus 145. Figueredo is plus 120. Uh, Three inches of height and three and a half inches of reach on the side of Rob Font. Um, This is a really hard one to call because we've seen some flaws in Rob Font, and we haven't seen many in Figueredo. But weight classes matter, and size matters, and I think that 135 is just better in general than 125. So I'm going to say Rob Font ruins Davison's bantamweight debut. I think the length matters. I think the jab is going to be landing a lot from Font. I think Figgy's going to have a hard time getting inside. And even if he tries to wrestle, I'm not sure I see Figgy having a ton of success wrestling Rob Font. So... Maybe I'll be wrong here. Maybe I'm down Figgy too much, and we're going to end up with a new 135-pound contender, but I just don't think this matchup is a great one for him to debut in. That The the glaring thing to me is just the length and the ability to use that jab that Rob Font should have in this fight. So it's another one where I could even see a finish. If it was five rounds, I think I'd pick it, but it's a three-rounder, and I will go with another UD, Rob Font, UD. Omar? I think I'm going to go in the Figueredo direction, man. Um, I, I, Rob Font likes to play at range. He likes to use his jab. He likes to use um, his boxing to keep guys away from him. But we have seen Figueredo kind of juggernaut his way forward. And he's not the kind of fighter that I think can be easily stopped like Rob Font can do to some other guys not at that level. I think the weight classes. Is good. I, th- I think seeing uh, Fig- Figgy at this weight will be interesting to, to get a real picture as to where he stands and how his skills translate with guys that are bigger. But in my head, just with the way that they fight, I feel like Figueredo is going to be able to walk him down a little bit. And I see Rob Font probably doing a little bit more backward movement than he might be planning to be doing. So I'm going to go with Figueredo here, man. Um, 
I don't think he finishes him, but I do think that he gets the better of him at least two out of these three rounds. So I'm going to go figure it out by decision. Wow, we had polar opposite takes on that fight. That was like first <laughs> take level stuff right there. Tell me the odds one more time. Remind me of the odds. Uh, font minus 145, Figgy plus 120. Uh, yeah, very interesting fight. A lot of variables to play here. The biggest one to me is that it'll be interesting to see how Figueredo fights a guy that is bigger than him because I think that he has enjoyed the advantage at 125 pounds so often of just, I think Omar used the word juggernaut. And I, I, I think of the same exact word of just being the juggernaut in the matchup of just being bigger and stronger and more athletic than seemingly pretty much every single one of his opponents down at flyweight. But now he's fighting a guy in Rob Font. And, and now I, I trust uh, sure dogs uh, <laughs> statistics a little, a little less here, but sure dog has Figueredo at five, five and Rob Font at five, eight. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see Figueredo match up against a guy that he's not going to be the juggernaut against. And another question, anytime a guy shifts weight classes up or down, the question is always, if a guy goes up, the question is, will he be rejuvenated now that he doesn't have to suck down so much weight or will he just be at a disadvantage? Um, I feel like, I mean, I'm looking at the the profile photo of Figueredo right now on his sure dog profile page and it's him walking into the cage in what was one of his flyweight bouts, and his his torso looks like a cheese grater. Like the man <laughs> must have fought with like two percent body fat, and he he was one of, he's one of those guys who had, at one twenty five he was scary to watch on the scale. It's like my yeah, god, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Give this guy something. So, God, you're right about that picture. I just had to pull it up myself. Christ, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, This is a little bit more of a field pick for me. I'm going to go with Figueredo uh, because he is a a goddamn dynamic and powerful striker. I'm going to say, I'm going to guess that uh, not having to cut to 125 is going to do wonders for him and his health and um, vitality in the cage on fight night. Uh, I'm going to say that he gets Rob Font out of there. I think he's going to give him a little bit of an onslaught in that first round. I'm going to say he's going to get him out of there in the second round by TKO. Wow, wow, wow. Love it. That'd be big. Yeah. We can it's make a big it. fight. We man. can make it, guys. Your boy, your boy's feeling the wall getting closer. <clears> I am too. I need to take medicine. My, You can probably hear it. My whole head is just closing up. I can't All right, breathe. Two more. Two more. <clears throat> we, go, we go fast. Okay, co-main event going down in the lightweight division. Jalen Turner taking on Bobby King Green. Real quick, this fight was uh, supposed to be a five-round co-main between Bobby Green and Dan Hooker. Uh, This would have marked the third time a non-main event, non-title bout, would have seen a five five rounds. However, uh, a week ago, Dan Hooker had to withdraw because he broke his fucking arm. Uh, and he was replaced by Jalen Turner. The bout has been downgraded from five rounds to three rounds. Uh, so here we go. Bobby King Green, the 37-year-old out of Redlands, California, 31-14 and 14 with one draw and one no contest. Uh, 20 finishes of his 31 wins. 11 of those are knockouts. Most recently, uh, back-to-back wins against Tony Ferguson back in July of this year and Grant Dawson uh, in October. Both of those are finishes. So Bobby Green has been looking fucking good lately. He'll be taking on a very interesting matchup at at, uh, lightweight. This guy's an interesting matchup for just about anybody at lightweight, given his stats. Jalen the Tarantula Turner, 28 years old, also out of California. He's out of San San Bernardino. His record stands at 13-7 and with nine knockouts and four submissions. You heard that right. All of his wins have come by way of finish. Uh, but he's looking to get back in the win column after back-to-back losses to Matoush Gamrot and Dan Hooker. Both of those are split decision losses. 
within this calendar year. Omar, start us off, buddy. The walls are closing in, but you're going to push against them. You're going to pick this goddamn fight. Give us your take and your pick of Bobby Green against Jalen Turner. This is such an interesting fight, man. Such a great fight. Um, Such a great matchup. I've been really high on Jalen Turner for a little bit now. Um, He's had some some speed bumps uh, in 2023 where Bobby Green has had some real rocketing success in 2023. Um, I think momentum-wise, these guys are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, And from a skill standpoint, man, it's very difficult to... Unless unless somebody is significantly better at something than Bobby Green, it's real hard to pick against Bobby Green, man. I think Jalen Turner, the best thing that he's got going for him in this fight, I would imagine, I think Mark could probably give us a little more insight on this, is the physical attributes of Jalen Turner. Jalen Turner looks like a massive motherfucking dude. He's like, I'll what, give it to you right now if you want to talk on yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. He's five inches taller, and he has a four and a half inch reach advantage. What is he though? He's like six one, right? He's six three. Yeah, six, he's six three at lightweight. Fuck me, man. Yeah, he's it's... the tallest lightweight. The the one thing you know the the length is is one thing. Um, the height is obviously a whole other thing. Guys that tall though in smaller divisions genuinely or generally tend to have like things missing in the durability department, right? Either their legs sometimes cannot have as much thickness or their arms may not be as, as thick as some other guys. Um, so there might be some vulnerabilities that Bobby Green can look after in that fight. The real issue with Bobby Green is you never know what Bobby Green's going to show up, right? He's a very unorthodox fighter, very playful fighter. He enjoys being in there. He enjoys the process. Um, sometimes though, especially when we start getting into the ground game, and the Tony Ferguson thing was a great, you know, a great move from him to show he still has ground game. He still got it. Um, but being on his back has never really been his forte. Being on top on the ground, probably a different story. But Jalen Turner might very well look for a way to take this down to the ground. And if that does become the case, I think this is going to be a very uh, rough night for Bobby Green. I'm going to go in the way of the momentum. In this specific case, though, so I'm going to roll with Bobby Green here, but I think it's going to be a rough, rough fight. I don't think either guy gets anyone out of there, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if this ends up being a split decision in the end, but I'm going to go with the decision win for Bobby Green. I will go next. Um, I, I, I know what to tell the truth. I, I like going without knowing the odds sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes I want to know them. But right now, I want to pick this fight blind. I- I always uh, make sure that I – not like I've never changed them, but like when we go into a week, I always write down my picks before I look at the odds for the same reason because huh, yeah. I don't want to be You'll, influenced. Right, exactly. You want to be swayed. Yeah. That being said, interesting fight as well. These are all a fucking interesting fights. Short notice, that's a big question mark for Jalen Turner stepping in on like a week's notice, but – Jalen Turner doesn't ever seem to be a guy who gets out of shape. He always is in tremendous shape, or at least looks like it. Um, And I think Jalen Turner is a hell of a striker. Before these back-to-back split decision losses, he was on a five-fight win streak. Uh, And that fight against Sam Hooker, man, in July, that was one hell of a fucking battle. Uh, I really felt like that could have gone either way. Um, Yeah. I'm going to be taking Jalen Turner in this fight. Uh, Bobby Bobby Green is very polarizing to me in his performances. He either looks phenomenal, like he should be top five, or he gets knocked out. Um, so I think that Jalen Turner, with those attributes, those those attributes and those advantages that he has, uh, I think he's going to use that range on Bobby Green. Uh, I think Bobby Green's going to be doing a lot of talking in there. Man, I, I love watching Bobby Green, though. Mm. Man, oh, yeah. I, I kind of hate making this pick because I also root for Bobby Green, and I want to see him in those big spots. But I also think that Jalen Turner is a great young up-and-coming guy at only 28 years old. Uh, I'm going to say he finishes Bobby Green, uh, I'll <laughs> say, in the second round. Uh, TKO for Jalen Turner. 
So you'll be happy to hear that the bookies agree. He is minus 220 as the favorite. What? Wow. Wait, Bob? Wait, who? Turner. Minus 220 favorite. On a week's notice. <clears throat> Correct. I'm what? surprised as well. Um, I thought he'd be favored, but not like that. I thought um, Bobby Green would be favored. I, I still thought it'd be Jalen just because of the size. Um, but so, but yeah, Bobby's plus 180. So if you like Bobby, worth wow. worth a bet there. Uh, five inches of height for Turner, four and, four and a half inches of reach for Turner. Uh, I might regret this pick uh, since I'm in this battle with Mike, but I'm going to go with Bobby Green, and it's for a couple reasons. Uh, I know that I heard originally Jalen Turner was not interested in, in taking this fight. He said he didn't like the timeline, didn't feel like he was ready for it, and was eventually convinced to take the fight, I guess, because of the money. Uh, so now a guy who already has a hard time at times managing his weight and sometimes his cardio has to do that on short notice. Uh, so, and, and plus he's going to have to focus very heavily on getting his weight down, I would imagine, for being such a big guy and probably not focus as much as he would like to on the game of Bobby Green. So I think that's all a factor here. Um, and Bobby Green, I think, is in the best form of, form of his entire career. It, it feels like his comp... Sorry, I literally can't breathe at this point. For anyone who's only watching the clip of the preview, I have COVID, and I, I've been all right, but it's fucking hitting me right now. Um, he, uh, But yeah, it feels like Bobby Green's confidence, which has always been high, has hit like the stratosphere. I, I don't think he can see himself losing right now, it seems. And I'm going to choose to believe. Uh, it's a dangerous pick, obviously, because Bobby is going to be willing to strike. And five inches of height and reach for Jalen Turner at 155 pounds is enormous. And we know he carries KO power. So Bobby is going to have to walk that tightrope if striking is what he's going to do here. But I think I, I am going to say Turner, Turner fades as this fight goes on under the pace of Bobby Green. And Bobby Green was ready to fight a five-round fight. So you know he's bringing the pace now in a three-rounder. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say that he takes rounds two and three and wins himself a big UD. Okay. That rhymed. That was nice. Ah, it did. I didn't even realize. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> All right, boys. Last one. Here we go. Main event, UFC Fight Night. Darius versus Sarukian. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that this is going down in Austin, Texas. So not at the Apex, at the Moody Center in Austin, Texas. Uh, according to the internet, the, the event will mark the promotion's fifth visit to Austin and first since UFC uh, Fight Night Cater versus Emmett in June of 2022. Uh, good to know. Okay, main event time. Also in the lightweight division, Benil Dariush taking on Armin Sarukian. Dariush, the 34-year-old, fighting out of California, 22-5 and five as a pro with one draw. Five knockout wins, eight wins by way of submission. Uh, most recently got TKO'd by the great Charles Dubronx Oliveira back in June of this year. Yeah, he did. Na- <laughs> the champion has a name. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, that loss mm. to Oliveira snapped a two, four, six, an eight fight win streak. Yep. by Darius. So looking to get back in the win column here, but a very tough task taking on the rising young star in Armin Sarukian, the 27-year-old out of Russia, 20 and 3 as a pro, <clears throat> eight knockout wins, five submission wins, coming off back-to-back wins against Demir Ismagulov and Joachim Silva back in June of this year. Uh okay. Omar, start us off. Give us your take and your pick of this headliner between Darius and Sarukian. This might be one of the tougher ones. Uh, I think we're probably going to pick for a while, man. Um, it's such a great fight. Sarukian has such promise uh, as he's come up through this division. Um, Darius has obviously had his ups and his downs. He's had a lot of ups until he had a big down. Um, and I don't know why, man. I don't know why it's so easy to almost count Darius out to a certain extent. Why I'm even, it's almost like that Tony Ferguson effect, right? Where like Tony was like winning and winning and winning and winning. And then he lost. And then it was difficult to sort of 
pick him after that loss. Oh, man. I mean, we've been talking about Saruki now for a minute, finally getting an opportunity in a big, big spot against Dariush. It is it's very difficult to pick, man. I I think I'm going to go with Saruki in here, man. I think I'm going to go with Saruki in here by second round TKO. Wow. Wow, TKO. You think he finishes Benil? Wow. I, if there's one thing about Benil that, that is – that is a thing is he's another one that doesn't eat shots very well. You know, he has moments where he can kind of swing back and, and, and try to fight through it, but his body does not react to getting cracked. Uh, like a lot of other fighters do like he's, he, he eats shit a lot of times when he gets hit really hard. And Sarukin is not the dude to be eating shots from. And Benil Dariush gets hit. That's a guarantee. So, I'm, I'm banking yeah. on Saruki and putting paws on him. I think it was his fight against Drakkar Close, who's also on this yeah. card, where he was rocked by Close. <clears throat> yep. And then in that storm, he found the finish. Yep. That yep. was uh, back in uh, 2020. Yeah, uh, I'll go next. Uh, I'll say this: there's a long. Tra- well, there are some traditions in this in this sport, and one of the long-standing traditions is that Benil Dariush keeps getting screwed and will never get a title shot. And I think that this is one of those fights uh, I do. Benil has only improved over the course of his career for getting the loss against Oliver recently. Uh, like I said earlier, he was on an eight-fight winning streak, just getting better and better, really peaking, culminating in that in that decision win against uh, Matius Gamrat, uh, even though that was a decision win Benil looked as good as he ever has against uh, the rising Gamrot, but then things went the way they went against Oliveira. And now he takes on the young phenom in Sarukian. Uh, And I I, I put a lot of stock in Armin Sarukian. I'll say that right now. Uh, He's so young. He's so talented. Um, And yeah, I agree with Omar. Uh, Benil is the kind of guy who will take a shot to give a shot. And uh, I think that Sarukin is a pretty complete mixed mar- martial artist, and he's going to mix it up. He's going to find his shots, and he's also going to uh, implement wrestling when he needs to, even though Darius is competent everywhere as well. But I'm going to go with Sarukin. I'm going to say that Sarukin gets this done uh, three rounds to two for Armin UD. Mark? I agree this is a very close fight. Uh, it is not that close on the lines. Armin is minus 305. Benil Dis- is a plus 235 underdog. Fucking disrespectful. Yeah, it's a bit a bit crazy. Um, three inches of height for Benil, but actually half an inch of reach for Armin. Uh, yeah, this is such a good main event because no matter who you pick, there's a very good chance that you could end up looking dumb. Like both of these guys are capable of being that good, and, and you can only yeah. pick one of them. You know, Armin's grappling is absolutely, absolutely elite. But would anyone be shocked if Benil puts on a scramble show like he did against right. Gamrot? Yes. And finds some bigger shots on the feed and wins? No, not at all. On the flip side, Benil seems like he's, you know, the bigger finisher and is so well-rounded that maybe he could find some advantages. But would we be surprised to find out that Armin is that good, that he just edges out Benil everywhere this fight goes? No. Yeah. So it's very hard to call. To me, Armin has lost two fights in his life, and they are the second fight in his whole career back in 2015, and a short-notice debut against Islam Mahachev where he made it to the cards. I don't believe he lost the Gamrot fight, so that is it. It's a pretty damn good record. Darius, as good as he is, I feel like we've seen more holes in his game than we've seen in Armin's. Armin is the one who, who is a bit more of a machine to me. He's, he's a bit cleaner bit tighter, bit safer. He's more responsible defensively. Doesn't let the game plan get away from him like Benil will tend to do at times. I think I trust Armin's cardio more. I'm not sure if I'm right about that, but it's what my brain wants to say right now. It's all small edges, and I don't have a great point to hang my hat on. Like, you know, Font, I went with Font because of his jab, and I didn't go with Turner because the late notice and the cardio. And this one, I, I don't feel like I have a strong point of why I want to go one way or the other. 
it's that close that I'm just, I think I'm just looking at these small edges of Armin being a little cleaner technique wise, a little safer defensively. And, you know, you got to lean on something when a fight's this close. So I will say Armin edges it 48 47 UD.